Yeah, welcome to this seminar to all of you from a fairly cold and rainy Delft. Uh, I'm in my office today at IHE Delft. Um, so um, on this slide, you will uh, can see the way I have contributed to the IPCC report. So I was a coordinating lead author of uh, chapter 12, uh, which concentrates on regional climate change uh, effects. And I was a lead author in the summary for policymakers um, and in technical summary, and I was a contributing author for several other chapters. I am at IHG Delft and Twente University and at Deltaris. Um, uh, please a note as indicated below in the slide. Uh, so all the material in this presentation is subject to IPCC copyright. Um, so you have to cite anything you use uh, of this presentation with the uh, uh, IPCC copyrights. Okay, um, so uh, for those of you who are not very aware of the IPCC process, uh, the last assessment report uh, was the fifth one, uh, which was released uh, in 2013 and 2014. Uh, let me move this a little bit. Um, and the sixth report, report uh, the first. Uh, follows the same kind of format. Uh, we have three different working groups. So working group one is the physical science uh, basis. Working group two is vulnerability impacts and adaptation. And working group three is more on mitigations. And, and then um, eventually we will combine all of these three uh, into a shorter report, a synthesis report. So uh, what was released recently in August, on the 9th of August to be precise, is the working group one report in which uh, I play a major role. Working group two and three will be released uh, in the first quarter of next year. And the synthesis report is expected to be released in September 2022. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the summary for policymakers, which is the document that actually gets read a lot and cited a lot in any IPCC report, uh, that's a very interesting process uh, for me too. I learned this time by participating in the approval sessions. Basically, it's about a 40 page document and it is approved line by line. Every line of this summary of policymakers is approved by the 195 UN, UN governments. So it's a very uh, long process, a lot of negotiations, a lot of attention to detail and it's uh, a two week approval session that goes basically 24 hours a day, someone is always online. Now, usually this is done uh, at a physical meeting, but this time due to this uh, corona pandemic, uh, we did it online, which was even more uh, demanding on everyone. So the author team of the working group one report from here after I will talk about the working group one report, which is already released. It had uh, 31 coordinating lead authors uh, distributed among chapters. So I was one of them for chapter 12 uh, and 167 lead authors, 36 review editors, 29 chapter scientists to help us with putting together the chapter you know, with the figures and the coordination. They do a lot of work uh, and more than 500 contributing authors. Uh, we have four lead author meetings. I think this was the uh, second one that was held in Vancouver. Uh, in 2019, so that's all of us together there. We were scheduled to have four such physical meetings, but we only managed three. The last one was held uh, online. Uh, the IPCC is also very serious about uh, representation across governments, across, across ethnicities, across, gen across gender. So uh, the team comprised of uh, authors from 65 countries and around 30% were women. Uh, and 30% were new to the IPCC. And the review process is, is really comprehensive. So uh, for this report, the working group one report, we assessed about 14,000 publications, all peer review publications. And then we go through the, about three or four cycles of requesting comments. And we received more than 78,000 review comments, each one which we have to address, can't ignore anything. Every comment has to be addressed. So 46 countries, um, can I minimize this? Yes, 
46 countries commented on the final government distribution. Uh, written comments. Um, so a question people ask is now, we are in the sixth cycle of the IPCC, so what is new about, about this report compared to the previous reports? Uh, I can mention a few. Uh, other authors may have different views, but I, I think uh, these listed ones are the main uh, new things in AR6 compared to previous assessment reports. We can now uh, really, with a great deal of confidence, attribute hazards to climate change. Uh, and that's because of better models and more data and, and better techniques. Uh, unlike previous reports, which uh, almost always gave sea level rise projections until the end of this century, in this report, we provide projections up to 2300. Uh, and this is a new thing which was handled exclusively in, in my chapter. We provide a regional assessment of 33 different climatic impact drivers. I will tell you what they are later in 51 different regions. So it's much more granular uh, in terms of the types of hazards we assess uh, as, all, as long as uh, the resolution to which we go to. It's not continent-based or global scale. We have divided the world into, into a number of different regions, including ocean regions, and we assess how these 33 climatic impact drivers are projected to change in the future uh, following different pathways and different global warming levels. Uh, and for the first time, uh, we have extensive assessment of coastal climatic impact drivers. Uh, in the previous reports, this was limited pretty much to sea level rise, but this time we go also into coastal floods, extreme sea levels, uh, coastal erosion, things like that. And this is a very interesting uh, development in AR6. We have interactive atlas, uh, which anybody can access freely and they can go to their region and see how any of these 33 climatic impact drivers uh, is projected to change in the future for a, a given scenario. So in my opinion, these are the main new things in AR6. Uh, so now, uh, to go into the first main part of this presentation, uh, uh, so I will focus here on uh, sea level rise, which is handled exclusively in chapter nine of the report. So first looking at the past, uh, we have now very strong evidence. You can see here, we have high confidence and these confidence statements are not arrived at uh, easily. You know, we, we have a method to arrive at this confidence limit. So whenever, you see high confidence in IPCC chapter, uh, you can, uh, you should think that we have look at different lines of evidence like observations, models, uh, reanalysis, re uh, a lot of things, expert knowledge, uh, attribution. And, and when we put all these things together, if everything points in the same direction uh, and also the number of papers saying the same thing, so then we have high confidence. So with global mean sea level rise, we have high confidence uh, that sea level has risen faster since 1900 than over any prior century in at least the last 3000 years. So this figure shows that the, the, the bit in the box, dash box here. So this is going back uh, about 2500 years. And this is how see, global mean sea level rise has varied up and down. And you can see since about 1900, we are on a very sharp increase. here. So if you take the global mean sea level rise uh, since 1901 to 2018, uh, it has written, risen by 0.2 meters, which doesn't sound like a lot. But interesting thing is that it is rising at an increasing rate. So if you take the first 70 years of the last century, the rate of increase was about 1.3 millimeters per year. And if you look at the time, since 2006, it's almost triple that. It's close to four millimeters per year. So something is changing uh, and seriously. Uh, so what are the main contributors to sea level rise? Uh, so here in this figure, we have indicated all the known key contributors to the global mean sea level rise. Uh, and um, in blue, are the, uh, is the contribution from thermal expansion, which 
was the main contributor to sea level rise before two, 2006. You can see, you know, in here in the early part of the last century, the blue dominates. But after 2006, the gray also starts to dominate. So and that is uh, from the melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Uh, so that's a concern, a very big concern. And since the 19, from the 1990s to 2020, the contribution from this ice sheet melting has quadrupled. So it's really uh, rapidly increasing. Um, now, in this report, uh, and also in, in working group two and working group three reports, uh, we follow slightly different scenarios to what then what was followed in previous reports. Um, so we have five uh, SSPs, we call them, shared, so, shared socio-economic pathways. Um, so we have one 1.9, pathway one, 1.9, where we assume that we immediately cut down. So here is the carbon dioxide in gigatons per year. This is uh, the x-axis is the time. So in this SSP 1, 1.9 uh, is a world where we cut down on greenhouse gas emissions immediately and sharply. Uh, and then we reach net zero by uh, well, around 2050. And the SSP 1, 2.6, is one where we slowly cut greenhouse gas, gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and we reach net zero emissions by about 2070. So this is more moderate to 4.5, where we keep maybe increasing a little bit and then slowly decrease from around, around 2050. And this is the worst case scenario, 5.8.5, where we just keep going um, as we are going, or even increasing greenhouse gas emissions, continue to burn fossil fuels. SSP 3 7.0 is something we introduced new this time. And this is, this is the pathway that we are on track now, uh, taking into account the pledges, greenhouse gas emission pledges made by countries uh, in the Paris Agreement. Now this uh, has been renewed in the COP26. Uh, so it might be slightly different, but 3.70 is, is, is the line we are tracking now. Uh, and, and if we uh, actually stick to the pledges made by the, by the countries in, in COP25. Uh, so this on the right hand side are the other uh, greenhouse gas uh, pathways. It's not only carbon dioxide, you should know that. So there's also methane, nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide are also greenhouse gases, which most people don't talk about, but actually could have very long lasting effects. Uh, so for each of these scenarios, then we also have a temperature projection. Uh, so here are the five scenarios. Um, and with these future emissions, whichever part we take, take will govern how much warming uh, we reach in the future. Uh, so these graphs are for the change in global surface temperature by the end of this century relative to the pre-industrial period, so 1850 to 1900. Uh, and in each of these plots, the dark area, uh, so this is uh, the total uh, temperature. The dark area is where we are now. And that's already about 1.1 degrees more than pre-industrial peri peri period. Uh, and for each, uh, scenario, then we have a maximum projection. So you can see with SSP 1.19, by the end of the century, we will stabilize around 1.5 degrees, which is the, uh, the Paris Agreement target. And if we keep going as we are going now, we will reach about 3.5 degrees uh, more than pre-industrial. And if we go in the worst case scenario, we will be reaching about 4.5 degrees by the end of the century. So just keep, uh, keep these scenarios and these warming levels in your mind. As I go along this presentation, I will, I will be referring to these scenarios quite a lot. Okay, so going to the future um, in terms of sea level rise. So these are the sea level rise projections to 2100 relative to 1900. So it's not in this, in this figure, which you can find in the Summary for policymakers, figure number eight. These projections are given 
relative to 1900. So you can see the different projections for the, for the different pathways. And uh, you can read them off, the, off this uh, graph, or, or there's also a table given. Um, but if you want to convert these to the present, then you have to subtract 0.16 from these projections to convert them to the present. So then you get for SSP 11.9, a sea level rise range of between 0.28 and 0.55, and for the worst case scenario, a range of 0.63 and one meter. So these are the likely ranges, uh, which have a probability of being reached of about 66%. So anytime you read a likelihood statement in IPCC report, that has a specific meaning in terms of probability. So likely is more than 66%, uh, very likely is uh, more than 90% like that. Um, and chapter one describes this, uh, all these uh, criteria we use. And you can see again with SSP 370, which is this red line here, uh, we could still reach a sea level rise of about 0.9 meters, uh, a likely sea level rise of about 0.9 meters by the end of this century. Uh, another thing we do in the AR6 is uh, also provide this dashed line, which represents a low likelihood, high impact storyline. So it's not a scenario, it's a storyline. Means if A happens and B happens and C happens, what could happen? Uh, so this storyline takes into account uh, this deep uncertainty about ice sheet instability, especially in the Antarctic, uh, and it can only occur on the SSP 58.5. There is some evidence saying that SSP 58.5 is something that we will probably not reach um, if we stick to the pledges made by the governments and, and increasingly unlikely uh, if these uh, renewed pledges made by the governments in, uh, in November, the COP26 are also honored. So that's a very worst case scenario, but under this scenario and under this scenario, uh, this storyline, uh, we could reach about 1.76 meters of sea level rise uh, relative to 1900 by the end of the century. Uh, so relative to today, then that's about 1.6 meters of sea level rise under this storyline. Uh, I want to caution you here though, uh, that for this storyline to happen, not only do we need to have SSP 58.5, but we also have to have all these things happening like, faster than projected disintegration, disintegration of the ice shelf, and abrupt and widespread onset, onset of uh, um, things like uh, ice cliff instability in Antarctica and larger than projected mass losses in Greenland. So all this, if all these things happen, then we can reach this line. Uh, I mentioned that we also provide projections up to 2300. So this is that projection, the figure in the, so here I have used the same vertical scale for the 2100 projection and for the 2300 projection, just to uh, be able to compare them. You can see a pretty bleak picture by 2300. So this is for th these shaded areas on this right-hand figure indicate again the likely ranges, so 66% probability. And, um, and the blue is SSP 1 2.6, which as I explained earlier is a pretty high mitigation scenario. Uh, and this is SSP, this SSP 58.5, which is the worst case scenario. Uh, so, but you can see even on this SSP 1, 2.6, we can reach about three meters of sea level rise. And on the worst case scenario, we can reach about seven meters of sea level rise. These are pretty serious numbers. And not only that, uh, if tipping points are reached in the Antarctic, and these ice cliffs disintegrate very fast, we cannot rule out sea level rise exceeding 15 meters compared to 1900 by 2300. So uh, that's also a possible situation, 15 meters. Um, now, we also have assessed uh, longer term sea level commitments. That's another thing to recognize is that sea level responds to warming fairly slowly. So what we do in this century and what we have done already in terms of greenhouse gas emissions 
will affect sea level for centuries or thousands of years. It's not like other things like you know, mean temperature or precipitation that respond very fast to de decreases in uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, sea level will continue to rise and there's not much we can do. Why we can minimize it by reducing greenhouse gas emissions immediately, but we can't stop it. It will keep going. So these are the very long-term commitments. If we reach uh, two degrees by the end of this century, or if we reach three degrees, no, sorry, if we reach two degrees, whatever time, or three degrees, uh, then over the next 2000 years, we can have a sea level rise of six meters, up to six meters. If we reach three degrees, if we stabilize around three, three degrees, sometime or other, we will reach 10 meters of sea. Um, so that's what we call a commitment. So we can reach 10, 10 meters. Um, so there's a long-term sea level commitment uh, due to the greenhouse gas emissions that we have made in the past and we might make in the, in the coming century. Um, right, so it's clear then, together with mitigation efforts to minimize sea level rise, we have to adapt because sea level will rise. And it, it, is, it is not a question of if, it's a question of when we will reach certain sea level amounts. So this will have major implications in low elevation coastal zones which are now home to about 680 million people. And this is projected to increase to about 1 billion by 2050. And, and a lot of this population is in small islands, deltas, and coastal megacities. Uh, the, this region, the low elevation coastal zone, contributes about 40% of the global GDP. So there will be big uh, socioeconomic uh, implications. And there's a lot of critical infrastructure like roads, railways, harbors, airports in this zone, together with a lot of cultural heritage sites. And importantly, decisions with time horizons of decades to over a century are being made now in terms of uh, spatial planning, coastal protections, uh, and infrastructure in these zones. These decisions are being made now. So, um, in recognizing this, uh, the AR6 also provides a regional assessment of key coastal climatic impact drivers. And specifically, so we refer to the climatic impact drivers as CIGs. Uh, specifically, we provide regional assessments because for these decisions, global mean assessments are not enough. You need to know what's happening in that locality, in that region at least. Uh, so um, we uh, break it down into different regions, like I said, 44 land regions and six, seven, uh, six or seven ocean regions. And then we provide assessments for all those regions uh, for these three CIDs. Relative sea level rise, which is different to global mean sea level rise because this also takes into account uh, more local processes like ocean currents and partly even uh, uh, vertical land motions as, to the extent that they are available, coastal flooding uh, and coastal erosion. Uh, so going into these uh, more specific regional CIDs, uh, we see in our assessment that uh, approximately two thirds of the global, global coastline will have regional relative sea level rise that is within 20%. So 20% more or 20% less than the global mean increase. So this, this needs to be taken into account when you're making uh, local decisions. Uh, and these projections for different scenarios and different time periods and different warming levels are provided freely in this uh, sea level projection tool that is hosted by NASA. So I invite you to uh, use that in, in the work you do. Uh, this is the link here. Um, and we see that relative sea level rise also contributes to increases in the frequency and severity of coastal flooding in low-lying areas, and it also contributes to coastal erosion along most sandy coast. We have high confidence in this statement. And uh, uh, chapter 12, so the chapter that I was involved in gives you 
magnitudes of projected changes in extreme sea level for two different scenarios and for two different times, 2050 and 2100. Um, so you can see, so here in the, in the colors, you can see a, a change uh, of more than one meter in extreme sea level magnitude. So this is the uh, 100 year event, 100 year retina period event. You can see by 2100 and under, under 8.5, almost everywhere it's blue. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be fairly big changes. Uh, and in terms of frequency of the occurrence of these events, in the global average sense, average sense the event that would today happen once every 100 years will become an event that occur, occurs more than once per year under RCP 8.5, which is comparable to SSP 58.5. So what would today happen once every 100 years would happen more than once a year, two, three times a year by the end of this century. Uh, but if we mitigate down to RCP 4.5, this event, the 100 event, will happen uh, every five years. So you can see there's a lot to be still gained by greenhouse gas emission reductions. We can go from multiple times per year event to one in five year event, but it will increase. Um, so that's uh, about sea level rise and social impacts. Now I will move on to uh, chapter 12. Um, so this chapter title is Climate Change Information for Regional Impact and Forest Assessment. So this, this chapter very strongly connects to the broader risk framework within the IPCC. And we are very careful in how we define risk. We define risk as the intersection of the hazard vulnerability, exposure, and damage. So whenever risk is mentioned, uh, that's how it should be understood. Uh, this is explained in detail in chapter one, uh, and also in these new uh, risk guidance documents that was released uh, by the IPCC in 2020. Uh, so what we do within this uh, risk framework uh, is first we define uh, the different types of climate changes that affect society and ecosystems. So by doing that, then we uh, define our 33 climatic impact drivers. And then we connect each of these climatic impact drivers to the eight sectors that are handled in uh, IPCC. And then we assess changes in each of these CIDs for all regions of the world, 44 large regions and then also uh, changes against global warming levels. And then finally, we connect this climate information to climate services, which is what feeds into local studies, uh, really. So what is a climatic impact driver? So this is the word to a definition from, uh, from the report. Uh, it's a physical climate system condition. So it could be a mean or an event or an extreme that can affect an element of society or ecosystems. So uh, distinction here in the way uh, risk is handled in economic circles, even if it doesn't have a economic value, the IPCC still considered this to be a risk. In the more economic literature, there has all to be, it, it has to be, the damage has to be monetized. Uh, but for the IPCC, it doesn't necessarily need to be monetized. Uh, and depending on the system tolerance, CIDs and their changes can be either detrimental, beneficial, or neutral, or a mixture. So that's also a departure from previous assessment reports. We always use the word hazard. This time we have gone to pains to bring across the idea that yes, climate change will have detrimental effects, but it could also have beneficial effects in certain sectors and certain regions. So that's why we use this term climatic impact driver, which is neutral. It, if we say hazard, it, it immediately has a negative connotation. Um, now, why climatic? Because there are also other impact drivers, such as earthquakes and uh, uh, political conflicts, and for example, COVID-19, these things can also, this can also have impacts. And so therefore they are also impact drivers. But IPCC is concerned with impact drivers that have 
climatic origins. Okay, so that's a distinction. So what are the climatic impact drivers that we assess? Well, this is the list I will not go through all. So we divided it, them into uh, seven uh, types, heat and cold, wet and dry, wind, snow and ice, coastal, oceanic and other. So in heat and cold, we get more known uh, impact drivers such as mean air temperature, cold spells, frost, extreme heat. In wet and dry, we have quite a few like mean precipitation, river floods, uh, aridity, fire weather, things like that. In wind, we have things like tropical cyclone, snow and ice. We have snow, glacier, and ice sheets, uh, hail, snow avalanches, coastal, I told you earlier, relative sea level, coastal flood, coastal erosion. And in oceanic, uh, the, the impact drivers that are more in the uh, not so much affecting the land zones, but the ocean itself, like uh, marine heat waves, ocean acidity, and then uh, three others, air pollution, weather, and radiation, things like that. <clears throat> so I also mentioned that then each of these CIDs, we also connect to different sectors because they must have an impact. So the IPCC uh, deals with these seven sectors, Terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, uh, water, health, well being, and communities. Mind you, in working group two, they have a chapter for each of these sectors. Right? So we connect each of these CIDs to these sectors and within each sector to a number of assets. So here is an example. Uh, this is here we take the sector food, fiber, and other ecosystem products which is the chapter five of working group two. And within that several assets, crop systems, livestock, forest, forest, forestry systems. And then in this table on, on this axis, we have all our CIDs and these colors indicate uh, the degree of relevance of each of these CIDs to these assets. So where there's a dark brown, then that's high relevance. So how to read this is, is for example, um, mean air temperature has a high relevance for forestry and a low to moderate relevance uh, for these other things like crop systems. If you go to coastal, you can see um, coastal flooding will have a high relevance for fisheries and aquaculture and a moderate uh, relevance for these other uh, assets. So that's the way to read this. White means either there's no relevance or we have low confidence on, on, on the relevance that a certain CID might have for a different as for, for that asset in that sector. Now this is this is a table in chapter 12, I think 12.2. Uh, and it continues down. So we, we consider all these different sectors and within each sector uh, assets. That's, that, that's, that would be the complete table, which I haven't shown here. Um, so uh, in the in 12.4 of this chapter, we provide regional information on changing climate for different parts of the world. So first for the continent, so 12.4.1 is Africa, Asia, Australasia, like that. And then uh, a, spe a special section for small islands, uh, open and deep ocean, and for polar regions. So each of these sections provide regional information for that part of the world. Uh, and that information is provided in different ways. So we give numbers and assessed confidence levels on observed changes and projections in the text. So if you take uh, this one section, 12.4.5, for example, that, which is Europe, and we have different subsections for those CID types, heat and cold, wet and dry, wind, snow, uh, snow and ice, sorry for this typo here, coastal oceanic. And then we have text like this, for example, for coastal erosion, we have text like this uh, that gives the numbers of the observed uh, shoreland retreat rates around Europe for the different sub-regions. So uh, uh, Central Europe and, uh, and Mediterranean here and the EU. And then we have text about also the projections 
So you have to read the text to get the numbers uh, for a specific region of the world. Then we also provide maps, global maps for six CIDs for two time slices and two scenarios. And these CIDs are uh, see, the number of days more than in a year more than 35 degrees, uh, number of days in a year where this heat index, which relates to the ability to work outside, is more than 41 degrees, uh, change in droughts, soil, mouse, soil moisture, mean winds and extreme sea levels. So we give these projections for SSP 58.5 uh, for mid-century and for end century, and as a reference for SSP 12.6 for the uh, uh, end century period. So you can compare this one against this one to uh, see the benefits of mitigation, and this one against this one to see the change from mid-century to end century. Except for extreme sea levels or extreme total water levels, uh, we didn't have uh, values for 2.6, so our reference there is 4.5. Um, then within each region, so here I think there's many of you from Africa here, uh, within each region and section, so 12.4.1 here, for example, uh, we also provide more detailed maps of certain CID changes. So here uh, we have a map of the 100 year return period stream flow event by 2050. Uh, and you can see here also the different subregions that we have uh, divided Africa into. And on the right hand figure, uh, the, all the uh, confidence, the uncertainty uh, is indicated for different regions. So these are all the, all the seven, uh, all, sorry, nine regions in Africa. Uh, and here we have the median values and the uncertainty for different RCPs and different global warming levels. So there's a lot of information uh, that you can glean from these figures. Uh, and this is another example we have in Africa, which is the shoreline position change by 2100. Again, the median values here and the uh, uncertainties on the right hand figure for the different regions. Uh, and then um, one of the main products of our chapter are these uh, kind of heat tables, we call them CID tables. So here uh, again for Africa, so we have uh, the different subregions in Africa on this axis. And here we have all the 33 CIDs and the colors in each of these cells indicates the level of confidence we have in an increase or decrease. So the hot colors like uh, pink and red indicate increases and, and bright red increase indicates that we have a high confidence in the increase and pink indicates we have a medium confidence uh, and the cold colors like blue uh, indicates decreases. So here we have high confidence, dark blue means high confidence of a decrease in cold spells and frost. Uh, and light blue here, for example, we have medium confidence of a decrease. And this is all by mid-century. Uh, and that is also comparable to a, a global warming of about two degrees relative to a, a pre-industrial. So, uh, but also I wanna highlight that there are these caveats here. There's some numbers in these cells. Um, sorry, white means we have low confidence. It doesn't mean that it's not happening, but uh, IPCC, doesn't do its own research. It assesses all the published literature, as I mentioned. So why doesn't mean that something is not happening. It means there's no literature. We, we can't find evidence uh, to be confident of, even at the medium confidence level for these changes. So uh, maybe the confidence will increase in the future when there's more studies. But there's also these numbers that are caveats to some of these uh, projections. So for example, if you look at coastal erosion, you see this four, number four, and number four says, if you look at this footnote at the bottom of the table, uh, that these projections are valid, so that this high confidence assessment that coastal erosion will increase by mid fifth century is valid along sandy coast and in the absence of additional sediment sinks and sources. 
or any physical barriers to show liability. So if these conditions are not met, then this projection may not be valid. So you have to pay attention to these caveats also. Um, the circles inside these tables are basically indicating whether the signal has clearly emerged or not. So if it's a black solid circle, that means the signal has clearly emerged already and we have medium or high confidence in it. Uh, and a purple circle means it is projected to emerge by 2050, at least for the high-end scenarios. Uh, and the white circle means uh, it's emerging in the, in the latter part of the century, at least for the high-end scenario. So we have such tables for every continent, incl including small islands and polar regions like this. Now I will take a couple here now. Let me see how I'm going to turn. 30 is still okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so we have tables like this uh, for every continent. And uh, these are then synthesized in this figure in the summary for policymakers. Uh, again, all the CIDs are on the top axis here. And here in this figure, we only show the number of regions where each CID is projected to change. So here purple means re number of regions with high confidence increases. And uh, pink is regions, number of regions with medium confidence increase. And here is, is uh, the orange is, is decreases. And this uh, shaded area is the number of regions for which a certain CID is relevant. So, I mean, you can imagine that for example, um, permafrost is, where is no noise. Permafrost is not really valid for some of the regions, right? The, 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 the regions don't have cold weather or high elevations, permafrost is not valid. So then the number of regions that is relevant is low. Um, so there's a lot of information also in this figure. Uh, and on the y-axis, we show the number of land and coastal regions in which the CIDs are projected to change. And on the right-hand side are the deep ocean CIDs. So again, there's less number of regions, fewer number of regions for which these uh, CIDs are relevant because they are only the ocean regions. Um, a thing to note here is these CIDs, the heat and cold CIDs, and the coastal CIDs seem to be, they are projected change in almost every region, very high numbers, see almost all regions. So uh, these things, we have high confidence will increase by mid-century. Now, if you take uh, the Africa table, CID table, to, to look at it a little bit more detail, because I know there's a lot of you from this region present today. Um, what do we see here at a glance? Main things that we see, I can't go into details here because of time, but if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me as a IHC alumni, you can always contact me and I will be available to you. So what we see here at a glance, uh, these CIDs that are changing everywhere. You can see the heat, the mean temperature and extreme heat is projected to increase in all African regions, regions with high confidence. And moreover, the signal has already emerged. Uh, and cold spells and frost is projected to decrease in every African region. Uh, heavy precipitation and provial flooding is projected to increase in a vast majority of regions. And the coastal and oceanic CIDs, all of them are projected to increase in all regions in Africa. If you want to look at the regions that are most affected, where most number of CIDs are changing, well, we see North Africa uh, and, and uh, Southern African regions, where most uh, CIDs are projected to change. Uh, similarly, if you look at Asia, it's a very large region. I think we have about 10 different subregions. Uh, again, we see uh, the heat and cold CID is changing. So in, uh, increases in media temperature and extreme heat, decreases in cold spell and frost almost everywhere. Uh, but in addition, we also see in a large number of regions mean precipitation increasing, 
and again heavy precipitation and pluvial flooding increasing and then again all the coastal and oceanic sea uh, increasing in all regions where there is a coastline in some regions there is no coastline right like uh, eastern siberia for example uh, some regions that are most affected uh, are these so west central asia russian far east and east asia and south asia so if you want to ask about the three main messages from chapter 12, uh, I would say uh, that we can say with high confidence that the current climate in most regions is already different from the climate of the early or mid 20th century uh, with respect to several CIDs. So that means climate change has already altered CID profiles and shifted magnitudes, frequency, duration, seasonality, and spatial extent of the social CID indices. And we can also say with high confidence that every region of the world will experience concurrent changes in more than one CID by mid-century. Uh, so going a little bit more into detail, we can say that heat, cold, snow and ice, coastal, oceanic, uh, and uh, carbon dioxide at surface uh, CID changes are projected with high confidence in most regions. Uh, and in other CIDs, uh, projections are more region specific. Uh, the level of confidence we have in projected direction of change in CIDs and the magnitude of the change very much depend on the mitigation efforts over the 21st century. So there is still a lot that we can gain by reducing greenhouse gas emissions immediately and making deep cuts. Um, so this is a summary statement that was also uh, made by our co-chair at the launching event. Climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, and the changes we experience will increase with further warming. Now I mentioned the uh, interactive atlas, so you can find that here. Uh, this uh, URL. Uh, I invite you to go here and uh, navigate in your area. You have different data sets, different variables, different periods, different seasons for different warming levels, all these different options here. Um, we may also have a training session on how to use the Atlas sometime in the future. Uh, I'm still discussing that with a colleague at Deltaris who was an author in the Atlas. Um, just a figure. And one thing in the Atlas, you don't uh, have a, a good coverage of the coastal CIDs. So we have made this at IG Delft, which is freely available. Coastal futures. So if you want to look at how climate change will affect, affect the coastal zone in your area of interest, I invite you to go to this website. It's free. And uh, you can see how regional sea level, extreme sea level, coastal flooding, shoreline change, and extreme waves, extreme waves are projected to change in any part of the world. You can zoom in for different scenarios, for different time periods. Uh, this tool was made by uh, uh, kind assistance provided by uh, the DUPC program uh, at IHE and with a very heavy contribution um, from the uh, hydroinformatics group at IHE. Uh, so I invite you to have a look at it today. And if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or any data requests, please uh, do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, contact details are uh, uh, yeah, given here. You can write to this email and we will deal with your request uh, as time allows. Uh, in addition to these products, uh, there's also a two page fact sheet summarizing the main findings for each continent. So, this is the fact sheet for Africa. Uh, these are available uh, also on the IPCC website. Uh, so, uh, you can download them there. So I think I will stop here. I hope I didn't bore you. So I think we have some time for a few questions. Fantastic. Uh, thanks a lot, Rosh. Thanks for the uh, that very comprehensive presentation and also like a very uh, uh, clear and explanatory presentation. Uh, we do have some questions, so let's start taking them one by one. Um, I will share my screen. Please give me a moment. I'll share the screen with questions.
So we can see the questions on the screen. I'll read them out for everybody's benefit. Um, the first question is from a baby who says he wanted to work on climate change impact on water resources using CMIP6. How can he select appropriate models and how many models should he consider? A baby, he says, Yared, a baby. Are you Yared, a baby? Please identify yourself. <laughs> or oh, is it different, a baby? Well, anyway, to answer the question, um, if it is Yared, a baby, I think we can also have a chat in the same building. Um, same if six results are available, yes, uh, from the uh, Ah, different now, baby. Okay. Uh, well, they are available uh, in, in the portal. Um, but you, so you should be able to download them. But um, it's, it's a lot of data. And you also raised an interesting question about how to select appropriate models. Uh, there's a long discussion on selection of appropriate models in Chapter 10 of the report. So I invite you to have a look at that. And, yeah, typically what we would do in a study is we, based on literature, we would select the models that perform best in that region uh, and only work with those because some, I mean, it, depending on where the model is made and hosted, these are hosted at very large research institutes. They do have a tendency to perform better in the region of the institute than in other areas. Uh, so it is important to select good models and how many models should I consider? Well, that's uh, also an interesting question. Uh, you know, um, if you if you want to quantify uncertainty and have confidence in, in your ensemble mean, I would recommend to use at least eight to 10 models, if not more. Mm -hmm. Q, the next question is from Sanjana Kurupu uh, from UNICEF who asks, as an IPCC report author, do you think that do you think decision makers at COP26 went far enough with respect to with respect to adaptation and mitigation measures? As an IPCC report author, I, I cannot make comments that are of a political nature. And this is uh, clearly of a political nature. What I can say is that a lot of IPCC authors, including myself, contributed heavily to COP26. And we did all that we could to make sure that the most relevant information was available at COP26. And I'm confident uh, that there has been a good level of uptake of the finding of our report uh, at COP26. OK. So uh, just picking up from the last part of your answer, I, can, I'll, um, I guess we could take up this question next. Does the IPCC have a sense of the extent to which its research and recommendations are being factored into, um, into planning and decision-making across the world? Yes, of course. Uh, again, I can't talk for the whole of IPCC, but I can... Uh, I can tell you about my experience as an individual. Um, yeah, I mean, the uptake has been tremendous. Uh, you, you, can, you can see also in, uh, in the level of news coverage that the report had uh, when it was released in August, um, and also in the, in the past assessment reports, how much those projections are taken or used in making decisions and in implementing adaptation strategies. It's, uh, I think, by far the most used uh, assessment in decision-making and implementation of adaptation and also mitigation efforts. So it's an unparalleled uptake, of course. Mm -hmm. That's why we work so hard on it for four years. Right. Uh, the next question is from uh, Gideon, who asks, how, how does sea level rise affect ground and surface water quality? Hmm. Well, it's an interesting scientific, scientific question, but I am not sure whether I am uh, the ex I have enough expertise to answer that. I have, of course, seen some studies where sea level rise uh, has been shown to affect groundwater levels, and uh, especially in islands, the, the freshwater lens uh, 
and, and affect things like uh, where you can place uh, uh, water pumping stations in rivers because the salt water which keeps going further in the rivers. Yeah. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of ways in, in where sea level rise can affect groundwater and and well surface water quality. Groundwater definitely surface water quality. Uh, maybe a hydrologist uh, in this group can answer that question. That sea level rise would it affect surface water quality? I don't know. Uh, I welcome any hydrologist to explain that question to explain uh, to explain that further in the chat. In the meantime, let's take up another question from Gideon, who has a who has another question similar in nature. What is the correlation between deforestation, desertification, and global flooding? Correlation. Um, I can't answer that question. We didn't look at correlations, uh, but def deforestation and desertification leads to aridity, so that's a different CID. Global flooding. Uh, is driven by well, by river floods and coastal flooding, so I don't think there's a di like direct connection between the hazard, but uh, in the impact of the hazard, there would be effect if, if areas are deforested and desertified, especially deforested. Uh, I, I think that could lead to extended uh, increasing the flood extents um, and flood depths, maybe even in some places, but. Then, if the area is arid and nobody is using that, then impact would also be minimal. I would assume. If there are a lot of houses and a lot of infrastructure, then the damage would be high. But if it's a barren area and if there's a lot of flooding, there's not much impact. The damage already done by the change in different CID. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sri Ratna, who asks: um, Does the IPCC research slash compilation process have to deal with political interference? If yes, how is that managed? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the word interference, but we definitely take into account uh, the feedback of governments, and that is done in several ways. Um, so first, when the report is caught right at the beginning of the process. There's a scoping session to which the government focal points are invited. And then the main, the, 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 the strong man outline of the report, with just subsections, high level subsections are decided at that scoping session. So that's right at the beginning. And then as we go along, as I mentioned, we have three cycles of uh, review uh, and the final round of review is called the final government review. So that specifically, the, the draft goes to governments. And then government organizations that are responsible for climate change will provide feedback, written feedback, comments, and we have to address those. So we address those as scientists. You know, if a government says, we don't like this statement, unless there are scientific evidence given for that, Unless such a request can be backed by published scientific papers, we will reject it. But if there's good substantiation provided, then, then we will accept it and make changes. And then the final level in which the governments are uh, involved is in the approval of the summary of policymakers, which, is, uh, which, which happens just before the release. Uh, as I mentioned, so there we have an actual discussion session where every line of the summary for policymakers, which is a synthesis of the whole report, is put up on a screen. And then there's the representatives sent by 195 UN government, governments. Uh, they can object to it or comment on it or request changes and then we evaluate those assessments and those comments. Sometimes we change them, sometimes we don't. So what, what, how we react to these uh, government comments and requests are purely um, based on scientific evidence. Interesting. Um, the next question is from Ms. Baul Haq. And, uh, Actually, uh, Abraham, one minute, just to finish that, my answer to the last 
previous question. Mm -hmm. What is important to realize is in the summary of policymakers is not released until all the 195 governments agree with all statements in that report. So at the end of the day, we have 100% consensus by all the governments. So no government can then go back and say, we don't agree with it because it's approved through consensus. And uh, the representatives of those gov of, uh, of the different governments are, sci are the scientists or are they uh, diplomats or bureaucrats? What is the nature of the representatives? Uh, I would say most of them, I mean, we, we don't really see their CVs, but having engaged in this approval session, I think they are all very um, learned scientists. They, they don't discuss at a political level. They do discuss at a science, scientific level. Okay, interesting. Thank you. The next question is from Ms. Baul Haq, uh, which is also the name of a very famous cricket player. Um, as a water resources uh, researcher slash engineer, what measures should we adopt to reduce this catastrophic rise in global mean sea level? Thank you. That's a very big question. <laughs> yes, that's a very big question. <laughs> and I think a question, Yeah, I, I don't think I can give a, a, a good answer to that question. Yeah. What about the cricket? <laughs> that is Insima Mulhak, right? Not Ms. Baulak. Uh, well, both of them. Uh, Ms. Baulak was a Pakistani captain, and they, he uh, he is also related to Insima Mulhak. Both of them are in um, into cricket. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good to know. Well, you know, we have clarified the important matters. So, <laughs> sea level rise. Now, I will try to ask this. I mean, what should what measures should we adopt to reduce? The rise in sea level rise, sea level, yeah. To reduce, it has to be a global effort. I, I think to reduce, the only thing we can do is really cut down greenhouse gas emissions. So if you can influence your governments in your positions to really commit to mitigation and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that's really the only thing we can do to reduce mean sea level rise. But as okay. I said, that's not enough. We will have to adapt. Especially in countries where there's a lot of investment in low-lying areas, we will have to adapt. So that's something governments also have to think about. Mm -hmm. So basically slice it any which way. The bottom line is that the need is essentially the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. I'm no getting it on that. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from uh, Gideon, a different Gideon, who asks how interaction of CID, say coastal flooding and high de intensity precipitation, uh, impacts in terms of risk profiling is captured in the AR6. Hello, Gideon. I know Gideon. Um, good question. Uh, so we call these compound events. So for example, where uh, coastal flooding is, is a result of extreme sea levels plus blue wheel flooding or river flooding. Um, we didn't find a lot of literature at regional level. So in chapter 12, if I remember correctly, we dealt with compound events only for Europe where we found literature. Um, but at a more um, coarser resolution, uh, or maybe, yeah, for, for some CIDs, for some extremes, these compound events are handled in chapter 11, which I was not really greatly involved in. So you could find things like the, what it means uh, when tropical cyclones result in more rain and elevated sea levels in chapter 11. Mm -hmm. So I invite you to have a look at chapter 11. So chapter 11 yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Tunisia. Um, what is the news regarding IPCC 2021 outcomes regarding the North African coastal areas, the Southern Ridge of the Western Mediterranean? Uh, are there any uh, highlights or key messages regarding that part of the world, that section of the coastline? Uh, Ula, hi. Uh, nice to have you here. But you missed the talk, so then I don't want to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to go to the report to find the answer to your question, Ula. So I, I think I, I would uh, then ask you to uh, maybe read that part for Africa. 
we do have uh, maps showing uh, extreme sea levels. Um, and I also mentioned the coastal futures uh, tool. You could also have a look at that for your interested part uh, of the world, which is Tunisia, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I have to now, uh, if I can put this, I can give you, a, let me see, I can go back to my presentation. Yeah, sure. You can just um, start sharing. I'll stop sharing from my side. No, I, I will just look at the slide. Okay. Ula is a very senior scientist who will understand my brief uh, response. So for North Africa, um, which is here in chapter 12, uh, we, what we, can, we take only the African portion of the Mediterranean regions. That's what we call North Africa here. Uh, there's an asterisk. So yeah, in that Mediterranean region, the top of Africa, we see high confidence in increases in all coastal sea IDs, relative sea level, coastal flooding, coastal erosion, marine heat waves, and ocean acidity. So I think that's the answer I can give to Ula now. But if you want to have a look at the numbers, then the numbers are there in, in the report in 12.4.1. Okay. The next question, which I think is the last question also uh, taking into account uh, the time is from Dr. S. V. Vijay Kumar, who asks in the matrix of drivers and projections for 2050, the white boxes are more. What does this reflect about its purpose or mean to readers? Um, yeah, good question. Um, So the white boxes, as I mentioned to you, are areas where we have low confidence in the direction of change. So you have to be careful in interpreting, interpreting this. There could be low confidence in the direction of change for many reasons. One is that maybe different studies give conflicting results. So one study could say increase, one study could say decrease, or maybe the ensemble is too small and we don't have a confidence in that projection. Uh, or maybe there's not enough uh, studies that have been done in, in that area. So if there's like, uh, if aridity has not, if, if studies of aridity at regional or continental scale have not been published so far for a certain part of the world, then also we have low confidence because as I said, IPCC is based only on published results. So if you have reports, government reports or gray literature that have not been peer reviewed, then we don't assess those. So that's the way to look at the white boxes. Uh, as I said, we were very careful in assigning this high medium confidence. So we, we prefer to err on the side of being conservative uh, than to give a high or medium confidence when we were not 100% sure. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rosh. I think with that answer of yours, we have come to the end of the proceedings. Uh, thank you for the presentation and for, uh, and, and for participating uh, in the Q&A. Uh, thanks for your patient answering of the, of, of the questions. Uh, if you have further questions to Rosh, uh, his contact details are readily available on the IHG website, which... Uh, uh, I think all of you know, uh, and you have also seen uh, the links that Maria has posted in the chat. Um, would really like to thank the audience for turning up uh, in good numbers and for the your questions and comments. A recording of the session, as, uh, 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 as Maria has already pointed out, will be available by tomorrow or uh, latest by Monday on the Water Channel, which is the waterchannel.tv and on the IIT website and the YouTube channel, you can find uh, the links to these things in the chat, which, uh, uh, which Maria Lara uh, was kind enough to post. Uh, we'll see you at, at the next webinar, which will be sometime next year. Uh, in the meantime, we would like to wish you a very uh, fun-filled, uh, family-filled uh, turn of the year. 
I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to wish you a very happy new year. We from the Water Channel and IIT Delft uh, wish you a safe, healthy and happy 2022. It's, it's a bit early to be saying this, but we do not meet again um, until sometime, sometime next year. Uh, until we meet again, take care and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rosh.